If you have or suspect you may have a health problem, or if you require answers to specific health care questions or concerns, you should consult your physician or health care provider and not depend solely on information presented in this program. And hello, I'm Dr. Steve Garner and welcome to Ask the Doctor. It's great to be with you today. As you know, this program was created to assist you in understanding medical issues so you can take charge of your own health. It's more important than ever to become an informed patient, and we are here to bring you timely health discussions. Now, for this episode, we're going to do things a little differently. We have a special in the news where you're going to hear about an instrument that can save your life. Then we answer questions from the streets of Brooklyn, as well as email questions. We have special guests today, so I want to welcome Jill Levine, her husband Craig Levine, and David Saltzman of Philips Healthcare. And David, before we get to a demonstration on this relatively simple device that can save your life, I want to speak to the Levines and hear a little bit about their experiences. And I know they have had some ability to use this and save lives. So welcome. And thanks for coming in. Thank you. Where do, where do you guys live? We live in Long Island in oh, Merrick. Had a tough time getting here? <laughs> a little bit. So, yes, it's brutal. You got the old Linda, Jackie Robinson, Linda yeah. Boulevard? Uh -huh. yeah, I got you. <laughs> the so, yeah, so. Okay, I know you had a very sad event, and I, I want the people to hear about the Robbie Levine Foundation because I think it's, it's very important. Sure. Um, Robbie was my son um, back in 2005 in September at one of our Little League baseball practices um, for his uh, team. He was nine years old. He was running around the bases at the end of practice, and um, when he ran across home plate, he had collapsed. And um, I looked over and saw him there on the floor and didn't really know what had happened. Um, I immediately went over, asked somebody to call for an ambulance. Uh, I noticed that he wasn't breathing and started to try to perform CPR for him. Um, if, after a few minutes or so, uh, a local um, volunteer firefighter had heard the call. He had come um, on his way. I asked him if he had a defibrillator. He didn't at the time. They took him to the hospital and they pronounced him. Now a defibrillator is a device that refers to when somebody's heart stops beating, it often what we call fibrillates and starts going like this out of control. What the defibrillator does is shocks the heart so that it stops it from beating and then it resumes normal beating afterwards. It's relatively simple to use, but unfortunately there was no defibrillator there. There was no one there. There wasn't one there. So um, what we've done since then is we've started a foundation to raise money to be able to donate defibrillators all across the country and also to raise awareness of the need for them in youth sports, but really in all public places. Have you found other parents coming forward who've had similar experiences? We, we've, we've definitely met some, but we've also met some who've been saved by a defibrillator. I know we had episode, I think, on a high school field in Brooklyn recently where someone was saved because it was available, and I think the entire audience heard it because they left the, the yes. microphone, right? Yes. Uh -huh. Someone from Midwood High School that was saved, so it's kind of amazing. Um, as you go around, what do you, you find people can use this device, the defibrillator, relatively simply, or does it seem to have a hard time using it? When you They're very easy to use. They t they, you push a button and they tell you exactly what to do. Particularly when you're nervous with CPR and, and you, you know, heightened awareness, or, you know, heightened nerves, that this actually calms you down and tells you a little bit about what to do. It takes you step by step about everything to do, and it can't, it can't hurt someone. If you, if you use it on someone it's, and they don't need it, it, it just won't do anything. And Craig, now you've had actual experience with this? Yes, uh, I've uh, used it twice on, pe on people. And when, in other words, they must have um, bought it. Was it a similar an athletic event? or? Well, actually, uh, the first one was the patient in my office. Um, she had been sitting in the waiting room, um, and my staff at the front desk heard someone collapse, and they looked over and saw that she was laying out on the floor. Uh, we happened to have the same machine in our office. We went ahead and called for the crash card and the defibrillator to come. Um, we called 911 right away. I put the monitor, the uh, defibrillator, on the patient, and it said that she needed to be shocked, and we did. And uh, sure enough, she came back, and uh, she's doing well now. And this is somebody who prob good chance wouldn't have made it without this device. Probably, yeah. You know, fewer than 10 percent of people survive cardiac arrest outside of the house. This adds to that number, though. This, this improves the number, and it's something that it's a shame when you, 
you have people around that could use it and you don't have the device. Uh, I know you had another experience? <laughs> the other event was uh, we were actually at a bar mitzvah of a friend of ours and the um, father of the bar mitzvah boys um, actually collapsed on the dance floor. And, that, that, uh, that opening horror gets you every time. <laughs> <laughs> it's brutal, and, brutal. <laughs> And uh, I saw him on the floor and uh, went right up to him and uh, called for a defibrillator. We were, happened to be in a country club, didn't know if there would be one there, but just, you know, kind of asked for someone to find a defibrillator. Sure enough, they happened to have two of them. And uh, we went ahead and we put it on him and, and he was, uh, you know, saved as well. So where does your, you advocate that these should be, where, where do you think these should be? Well, I mean, they pretty much need to be everywhere nowadays. I mean, we see them in schools, of course. You see them in airports, um, malls. I mean, wherever people can congregate, they can uh, help out. I know. I've seen firsthand at JFK, because we used to run a, a medical facility there, people, particularly on Monday morning, for some reason, people have the heart attacks Monday morning. I, I don't know. They just they love to go back to work. <laughs> so um, these have saved people where they would not have. Where people out in the terminals have learned how to use this. Um, and we're calling, talking about the defibrillator AED, Automatic External Defibrillator. And what's interesting is that anybody can get this for, for his or her home. You don't need a prescription. Actually, the Philips who have been courteous and brought this piece of equipment in, this is the only equipment that you can get without a prescription. Now, there's some controversy about having it at home or not. And um, I, I don't understand it exactly because people are saying, well, they may not know how to use it, or you, you really can't use it wrong, as you said, Joe, right? right? And why not learn how to use it? You know, you learn how to operate your remote control and your VCR. I mean, for this, you wouldn't take the time to learn this and to do drills and free, because 80% of the cardiac arrests occur in your house. So you're talking about your, your family, people who you're gonna, who you could save. You're not talking, you, you know, you want to help strangers, but what about your family that's in your house? So why would you avoid having this in the house? Um, I think the problem with some of the studies, and I don't know what you think, is that there haven't been enough, you know, that there's not enough people that have cardiac arrest in the house to make it statistically significant, the study. But, I mean, logic will tell you that it's better to have this. If you're in the house and somebody has a cardiac arrest, who, who wouldn't want this there? Of course. The statistics have been proven that for every minute that somebody's in cardiac arrest and not defibrillated, their chance of survival decreases by 10%. So after five minutes of being in, in V-fib and, and needing to be defibrillated, your chance of survival at that point is 50%. So, um, you know, you really, not only having the machine, but you also need to take a basic life support class that also teaches you how to do, um, you know, basic life support, um, someone that has a cardiac arrest, as well as learn how to use the machine. One of the things that we do through our foundation is we sponsor um, AED CPR training courses. We do it all the time. We, we do it, we open it up to everybody in the community. We do it right in Merrick and we do them now. We're starting them in schools. We're starting them in any community that wants to do it. We set them up. This is, a, this is the key because I've seen statements like, well, CPR is just as good. Well, why not do both? I mean, mm -hmm. what, what's, what's the problem? You know, learn to do CPR. We know now you don't need to do mouth to mouth. Right. You know, you do that staying alive song to the Bee Gees and keep <laughs> pounding on the chest. I see David knows, is gearing to go here to give us a demonstration of the AED device. And yes, it would be my pleasure. Um, this is the uh, device, actually, that the, uh, the foundation donates. They were kind enough to donate one to my little league. Um, very, very simple to use. Really, you're just pressing the on button and following the prompts. So now what would happen? The remove scenario... Remove clothes from patient's chest. Remove clothes from patient's chest. So somebody on the floor you passed would, out and when you... When patient's chest is bare... Open gray plastic case and peel off white adhesive pads. So here's our case right in here. We would open the case. Look carefully at the pictures on the white adhesive pads. Peel one white pad from the gray case. Place pad exactly as shown. And you'll notice the picture right on each pad, so it makes Press it very easy. to bare skin. Take out the second so, so far pad. looks good. I don't know where this guy's from. This accent is throwing me. When the first pad is in place, peel the second pad. Place pad exactly as shown. Stay clear of patient. Analyzing heart rhythm. See the warning? Now it's going to tell. Stay clear of patient. We're going to see if we have the Analyzing heart rhythm. Shock advised. Stay clear of patient. Press the flashing orange button now. Shock delivered. 
Be sure emergency medical services have been called. It's very important. It is safe to, to touch the patient. You want to call Begin CPR. Be, call 911. CPR. Press the flashing blue button. So there's an important feature in this device. You press the flashing blue button, and That's it gives you CPR coaching. Place the heel of one hand in the center so of then the you chest. Would, mm -hmm. between the right to the, the patient. Place right here. your other mm -hmm. hand on top of the first. Push the chest down firmly two inches. David. And you would do the CPR. The and there's your metronome right there. So, so it gives you the rhythm. The prompts. It gives you that amazing. rhythm, the staying amazing. alive rhythm. I mean, this is amazing. So now, most people don't even remember what to do. The key was they told you to call 911, right. start CPR. But the first thing to do was Pitch to nose, tilt press that green button and, and get it started. Get started, started on the green press. button. And people should know where it is. You know, keep it in a prominent place in the house so you don't lose it in the closet. You know, people, oh, it's in the closet somewhere. You know, you want this out. And I'll shut the device off at this point. So it's yeah, taking you through your American Heart Association guidelines of compressions and ventilations until the patient, you know, either needs it more or doesn't need it anymore. See, I would recommend every, speaking to your doctor to see if you should have this at home, especially if you're at, at increased risk, if you have some kind of an underlying heart disease or rhythm disorder that this, this really could be a critical thing. And then to rehearse, to rehearse a lot. Do you guys, you guys must have one in the house? Oh, yeah. 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 Do you rehearse? How do you, you keep current on that? Well, we take the, we take the course every uh, two years, and that's, that's enough. No, I understand. You don't need a prescription for this. You don't need a prescription for the Philips on-site model. Um, the FRX model, you would need a prescription for. I don't think they need use. any fancy models. Just go and get the one. You, the you know, it's like the guy's going to sell you under rust coating. As you can see, it can't get any simpler. Right. Yeah, yeah. He's a good salesman, though. Yeah. See, that's the FRX. <laughs> I like that. But um, I hope that this has been an interesting segment because somebody's going to need this. I guarantee you, somebody out there watching this could be saved. If this were in the house, if this were in the church, if this were in the, the supermarket. Actually, we had a meeting to go over this at the River Cafe, yes. and we discussed it with the River Cafe people who didn't even know that this was available. So we look for, you know, you've got to get the word out there. Yes. And I think you guys That's are doing that. That's what we the, try and do through our foundation. You know, amazing. So you must travel all over the country? Uh, locally, locally. But we have, uh, we have donated all over the country. People hear about us through yeah. online. And there's enough people to help locally. Oh, yeah. yeah okay. <laughs> So I want to thank uh, Jill and Craig Levine for sharing the story with us, and thank you, David. Um, we're going to take a short break, and when we return, we're going to meet our panelists for today, and the topics for discussion are emergency medicine, breast disease, and geriatric medicine. We'll be right back. I'm Dr. Steve Garner, the host of Ask the Doctor. In addition to watching Ask the Doctor every Tuesday night at 8, you can also visit www.netny.net slash doctor. There you can find the topics and guests of each episode. You can read my column from the week for the tablet, and for more advice, you can watch episodes you've missed. More importantly, you can post your questions and I'll answer them on the video blog. So visit www.netny.net slash doctor and get your daily dose of healthy advice. And welcome back. For this episode, we have Dr. Barbara Gatton, emergency medicine physician at the New York Methodist Hospital. Also, Dr. Robert Seminara, breast disease specialist at New York Methodist Hospital. And Dr. Ina Schifrin, geriatric medicine attending at New York Methodist Hospital. And welcome. Well, that was, that was quite a segment, wasn't it? Yes. A very interesting segment. I want to announce the quiz now so you at home can, can get moving on this, because I know this is always a, one of the highlights of the show. Well, we all know the 83rd Academy Award is coming up. Have you seen any of the big, uh, you see that um, speech, yes. the King's speech? The King's what do you think? Speech was well. Didn't see it. Didn't see the King's speech. Did you see it, Ina? Not yes. yet. Good show. It's a good. Not the best, but it's not bad, right? Right. It was and what's the other one? There's another one that people like. Um, the spy, uh, not the spider, the black swan. The black swan. Yeah. See that one? With Natalie Portman, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. That was interesting. Didn't you saw it? it? Yes. You liked it? Would, would you recommend it? I would. All right, two thumbs. Very good, very good. So here's the question it. now. Um, the, the Academy Awards, by the way, are going to take place February 27th as a public service, 2011. Who was the person that got the longest standing ovation of all time at the Academy Awards? Okay, the one who got the longest ovation of all time. And now you have to email us your questions because we're doing a special. We want to try and encourage people to email. So you email it to askthedoctor at netny.net. The first person who um, is going to accomplish this, get the answer, is going to win the coveted plaque. Okay. Now, this is a special episode. We had a, a special in the news, which you saw earlier. 
and now we're going to answer your questions. We sent our crew out onto the street. That's where they belong. No, <laughs> we sent them out on the street, and they went around and asked people on this uh, inclement weather that we've had on and off, and they're going to be asking questions about uh, emergency medicine, breast disease, geriatric medicine. We like to do this once a year, and we get to meet, meet many of you now. So before we get to the questions, let me tell you who we're dealing with. Dr. Barbara Gatton, and um, did you have a little romance yesterday on uh, the Valentine's Day? I had a Day? very lovely dinner with my husband. Uh, it was very, and we went hiking earlier in the day. Oh, that's a little different. A little candle. We always take the day off. Very nice. Very nice. A candle, a little candlelight at dinner? No, no, no candlelight. Okay, it was nice. <laughs> and <Lady> Dr. Boots. <laughs> <laughs> Dr. Seminara, I know you have a special tradition. And we went out to dinner for Valentine's Day. Oh. She's a resident in Morristown in pediatrics. Beautiful and, uh, daughter who's worked with me, one of my favorite students yeah. of all time. Uh, thank you so much. And uh, we had a great, a great evening. You know, it was just lovely. That's great. I'm glad. It's nice Dr. To be Schifrin, who's sm still smiling. I know you had a good day because you're smiling into the next day. So yeah, we just stayed home with kids and the cats, so we had a wonderful, relaxing night. That's the best way to do yes, it. Cause yes. I think you go out. The restaurant is. I mean, not, you. I mean, we went out, but we went out because we were tired from our hike. Very okay. okay. Very good. Very good. So now that we've met the doctors, I just want to bring up an article that I saw today before we get to the street. It seems that 100,000 lives could be saved if blood pressure and cholesterol levels were better controlled. Now, these are people who are going to the doctor, and yet they're not getting proper control. Um, so let's just go over some of the reasons and what you think. Dr. Schiff, what, what do you think about that? Um, I think one of the biggest problems, as we talked before the show, is compliance. It's very difficult to take uh, regimented medication. Some people, especially elderly ones, can forget. And if you miss a dose here and there, the blood pressure will not be controlled. A lot of people have, have side effects from the medicines. And I think that's very important for the patients to speak to their doctors about it to see if the medicine can be changed. Oh, um, so you do have, you have alternatives. There's no need, right? If you're having a problem with the blood. Absolutely. I think people think, well, this medicine gives me a side effect and I don't really feel sick, so I'm not going to take it. When really there's so many choices of medicine, if you have a side effect from one, you may not have a side effect from another blood pressure medicine. And it can't be more important to control your blood pressure. But most importantly, I think that the decision to not take your medication mm -hmm. uh, because there are side effects or for other reasons should be made conjointly with your physician. In other Absolutely. words, if you're going to start the medication because your doctor recommended it, um, then the desire to stop it mm -hmm. because of side effects or for any other reason should be made conjointly with the doctor. And uh, the physician should be available for the patient and the patient should inquire about that stuff. It's a teamwork approach. Uh, but there are so many medications now that no one should suffer with uncontrolled hypertension today. And the problem is you don't know. It doesn't hurt you. You're walking mm -hmm. along a time bomb waiting to explode, and you have no idea. Mm -hmm. Correct. And then talking about CAT scans, there was a story today that caught my eye. A dog now, a dog is taught to smell feces of human beings and can pick up which one has cancer of the colon 97% <laughs> of the time. Smart dog. <laughs> Smart, it's a tough job. tough job. Not a good job. Not a good job. But um, I don't know why I'm going to trade my poodle to do that. But they were actually going to start training dogs, and that's going to be the limiting factor because it's hard to train these dogs, you know, mm -hmm. to do that. But 97%, and the standard test that we use now to, for cold blood or for hidden blood in the stool is only 78% effective. So anybody, anybody running out to buy a dog? I know. <laughs> I think that it's, I'll still stick with a screening at age 50 with a colonoscopy. and There you go. Well, dog is man's best friend, and there's no question about that. I love dogs, and I love pets, and I love animals, but the idea is this. Bring your dog to the doctor, tell the doctor what the dog could do, and again, it's teamwork all the way. <laughs> it's a teamwork. Do you have a dog or no cat? No, two cats. Two cats. Okay, they were no, they didn't, they Eventually, smell well, anything. now yeah, I'm definitely will. getting one. <laughs> So my dog knew when my cats were sick. Really? Mm -hmm. Really? The dog was the first one to tell us. See, mm -hmm. that's a, yeah. I, I put a lot of stock in this. I think dogs um, are, I think they're smart. Sure. What do you think? My dog's definitely okay, smart. Okay, now, now we've cleared up this in the news, let's go to our video question. Let's go right to the street and let's see what our first question is. So. Hi, no. doctor. How do I know if my chest pain is due to heart attack or heartburn? It looks like Neil wants to know. And I couldn't, I'm going to read this. I don't know if you could hear it in the audience. How can he tell the difference between chest uh, pain that is heartburn versus a heart attack? When should he be heading to the emergency room? When can he rest assured that it's not serious? I think 
One of the things to worry about are always the, your risk factors for heart disease. We worry about people who are older. We worry about people who smoke. We worry about people with high blood pressure and diabetes. But the most important thing is to talk to your doctor if you're concerned, and they can do some tests to find out if you're at risk for having a heart attack and find heart disease before you have a heart attack. That's good. You know, what about your patients that are 80s and so on, and they may have silent heart attacks, you, you know, they, where you, they may not feel it. Um, any correct. clues, that, any differences in, in older people? Um, you know, the chest pain that we talk about so much can be typical and atypical, and typical would be something where the patient comes in and says, well, my chest hurts, and I feel an elephant sitting on my chest, and they point to the left side, mm -hmm. and it radiates down to the left arm, and the jaw, and et cetera, et cetera. But most older people, or women, or mm -hmm. people with diabetes may not have those typical uh, uh, symptoms, and they will present differently. They can present with nausea and a stomach pain, and a lot of uh, patients would come in and say, well, I have this, this sensation in the pit of my stomach, and then you get to, to worry about a heart attack. They will have diaphoresis, which is you know, cold sweats. They may be dizzy. They may be short of breath. And again, I think what Dr. Gatton said about the risk factors mm -hmm. becomes very, very important in assessing who your patient is and whether or not this could be a true, yeah. true chest pain that we need to worry about. So seeking doctor's help in timely fashion is very, very, very important. Probably better to err on the side of, you know, Caution. coming in with nothing. Absolutely. Yeah. I Absolutely. would rather someone mm -hmm. come to my emergency department and I get to tell them that they're okay than them stay home and have a heart attack at home. Last yeah, comment? I, uh, I think everybody, your panel summed it up beautifully. It's a great panel. Uh, great panel. Uh, however, I just think, you know, for the patients out there, any kind of discomfort they feel that is different than usual, that is not relieved in a few seconds, and it's something different than they've ever felt in the past, please go to the emergency department. Regardless of what we may hear, we have the greatest health care system in the world. <laughs> Let's use it. Very good. Now we're going to go to um, an email question from Elena, and she was switching channels, and you guys caught my attention. That's, with this beautiful panel, I would catch beautiful a lot of attention. Panel. That's a big boost to our audience here. I think it's, the program is great. I'll read that again. I think the program is great. My father had a prostate surgery in 2003, and he has been under Avidot and Flomax. He has not visited his... Now, she writes GU. That's, um, let's say, uh, what should we call it? Urologist. Urologist, let's call that. Been to his GU doctor in three years. He hasn't been there and he's fine. My first question is, should my father visit the urologist annually even if he's fine? Let's my answer is absolutely yes, without question or doubt. And uh, there should be communication about his wellness with his primary care physician mm -hmm. and his family. And, uh, you know, one of the biggest problems today in healthcare, albeit in the hospital or otherwise, is communication. We talked about that with high, hypertension mm -hmm. and high blood pressure ask questions, get involved, and communicate, and uh, absolutely. This is not something that you do, and it's done. And look, now the second question comes up, how parents suffer from high blood pressure, and the medication that my father gets for high blood pressure, well, there's no problem with that. But my mother gets a different kind of high blood pressure medication to the point where she's totally confused. She wants to know, is this right? I'm not comfortable with her doctor. I'm looking for a new geriatric doctor. And then she throws in a pitch for our Dr. Kotsina, who's been on his many, many show many times, that Dr. Margaret Kotsina caught her attention because her mom's name is Margarita. So what about that? You know, his, the husband's doing fine, the mother's uh, collapsing. She's, she's obviously unhappy with the choice of the medicines. And as, again, as we mentioned before, there's just so many choices for the blood pressure. The confusion may come from using a beta blocker, which is a very good medicine mm -hmm. and is very helpful in controlling the blood pressure and preventing heart disease. But yet again, if this is not a right medication for this particular patient, there's so many choices that we could do, um, including the lifestyle modification and risk stratification to control it. Very good. Barbara? And the one that's right for her father still may not be the one that's right for her mother. That one works for one person does not necessarily mean that she needs to be on the same medicine as your father. Very good. Let's go to Althea. Althea should be on the street somewhere. Althea, can we find you? I think you should be somewhere on 7th Avenue. Althea. Why should I have to wait so long when I go to the ER? Althea wants to know why she has to wait so long in the ER. <laughs> I know, we hear that a lot, and I apologize whenever you wait in the ER. 
The problem for us in the ER is that we can't predict how many people are going to have emergencies at the same time. So when you make an appointment with your doctor, they know how many people are coming in and they schedule you. In the ER, one day it may not be a long wait, and the other day it may very well be a lot of people sick at the same time. The other problem is it's not first come, first serve. In the emergency department, the sickest person gets seen first. The person who has a life-threatening illness, a heart attack, a stroke, that person's going to be seen right away. And other people, unfortunately, may have to wait. But please come and please wait. We will see you. You know, there's a lot more even to that. You know, uh, as times change, right now, today, um, things are different in healthcare than they used to be. Now, all patients that get admitted to the hospital that are not scheduled need to present themselves in the emergency, or emergency department. So that even overcrowds the emergency department even more. So more and more patients are using the emergency department. And more and more patients are using emergency department for well care too. So most emergency departments or emergency rooms are trying to accommodate for that, just like you said so eloquently. So it's tough, but if you're not feeling well, get there. But Dr. Schifrin, if I go to see you as a patient, what's the average wait going to be? It depends on the day. It depends on the day because we do accommodate for walkings and urgent appointments. Um, somebody with the problem would try to see them that same day. Um, so there could be quieter days sure. and really, you know, really busy days. But we try to see everybody within half an hour. That's good. It, sometimes it works out, sometimes it does not. Very good. Okay, let's go to one more email question before we take a quick break. This is from Odessa in Queens. She wants to know, I'm a type 2 diabetic. I have arthritis in both legs, knees, and feet. She's 55 years old. So she feels that something is torn in her knees that ties up her legs. Um, she needs to lose weight. Can you recommend a type of low-impact exercise for, for me? So she's a little bit overweight, has arthritis, but she wants to do exercise. What can she do? I think the most important thing to find out would be what is it that exactly torn in the knee. If this is a meniscal tear with ligaments, uh -huh. if the knee is highly destabilized, you really don't want to start going to the gym and do bicycles and elliptical and all those things. Also, if you're a little deconditioned with diabetes and, and obviously weight is an issue, I think the good approach would be to speak to a primary care physician to start with the diet and healthy, uh, uh, you know, lifestyle modifications, uh -huh. and then the physician can further recommend uh, the type of exercise. A lot of times, doing a physical therapy and rehabilitation for the knee and for arthritis will bring that necessary exercise and the boost to start a healthy program. Very good. Any other suggestions? Mm -hmm. In general, low impact for knees would be bicycles and swimming, and that's sometimes difficult in February, but. Um, but a gym and a bicycle. But again, as Dr. Schifrin said, you don't want to get on a bicycle with a knee injury without speaking to a physician first. Very good. Bob? Non-weight bearing as yeah. we get older is very, very important. The knees are a tremendous source of impact as we <laughs> walk and sometimes we see people, you know, near our offices at 82 years old jogging and, you know, they might have wonderful hearts, but they're not too good with the knees. So non-impact exercising, and today, you know, discussing that mm -hmm. at the gym or the fitness center where you go to can help her. But then nothing replaces the communication with the doctor. Communication, big word. Once again. We're going to take a short break, and when we come back, we're going to be going back to 7th Avenue and your email questions for emergency medicine, breast disease, and geriatric medicine. Remember, we have Dr. Barbara Gatton, Dr. Robert Seminara, and Dr. Ina Schifrin. We'll be right back. I'm Dr. Steve Garner, the host of Ask the Doctor. In addition to watching Ask the Doctor every Tuesday night at 8, you can also visit www.netny.net slash askthedoctor. There you can find the topics and guests of each episode. You can read my column from the week for the tablet, and for more advice, you can watch episodes you've missed. More importantly, you can post your questions and I'll answer them on the video blog. So visit www.netny.net slash askthedoctor and get your daily dose of healthy advice. And welcome back to Ask the Doctor, where our topics are emergency medicine, breast disease, geriatric medicine. We have with us Dr. Barbara Gatton, Dr. Robert Seminara, and Dr. Ina Schifrin. Now remember the quiz. The 83rd Academy Awards is going to take place February 27th. Who got the longest standing ovation of all time at the Academy Awards? 
you don't call this one in now, email it to us at netny.net. That's ask the doctor at netny.net. Okay, now let's uh, resume. You know, waiting for that commercial, you know, we're excited with the show. Yes. You know, there's a certain, there's a good energy here. And Dr. Seminaris, I, I said I was like a racehorse waiting to get out of the starting gate, and he had an interesting uh, comment there. Why, why Race is that? Racehorses, <clears throat> uh, my uh, favorite pastime is riding horses, <laughs> and uh, so I know something about them. And racehorses are very seldom turned out, almost never. So hmm. that's why the horse looks so excited getting into that gate and when those doors fly open not only is he or she trained for it but they just can't wait to run because every horse as soon as they're turned out overnight just wants to run. Just wants to run. Even, even a horse that's a domesticated horse that you ride for pleasure in the morning wants to go and, and then he'll be okay for the whole day. It's like me with the show. As soon as you put it just on like I want like to do this Ask show. the Doctor. I'm out of there all day. Yeah. There you go. So welcome back to Ask Thank the Doctor. You. And um, from Robert, doctor, what is the Hogan syndrome? Or what causes that? The Hogan syndrome. I don't know, Robert. You, you, you might have stumped us here because I, I'm not sure what the Hogan. I know the golfer was Ben Hogan, right? Ben Hogan was a golfer. But uh, why don't you call us back and give us a little um, answer? I, I think I want to go back on the street because I got shaken up here with that Hogan syndrome. <laughs> the Hogan. So, can we go back on the street? I think we have Claudia who wants to ask Dr. Seminara a question. Claudia, what's your question? Hello. Uh, this question is for Dr. Seminara. And Dr. Seminara, uh, who would you suggest uh, get an MRI of the breast? Uh, at what age, or is there any person should have any risk factors? Thank you so much. Well, a fan of Dr. Seminara. Well, thank you very much for your question, Claudia. MRI is a relatively new test. It's a good test. Um, however, there are no hard and steadfast indications right now mm -hmm. for who gets an MRI. MRI is a tool, an adjunctive tool for all women to help make a diagnosis. Now we know that women who have had breast cancer for whom may be deciding on whether to have a lumpectomy or a mastectomy, MRI could be a very useful test on that breast mm -hmm. to let us know more about what's going on. However, it's important also not to know about the MRI. Um, the MRI is an examination which carries about a 97 to 99 percent accuracy for breast cancer. Mm -hmm. And it sounds overwhelmingly like that's a wonderful thing, you know, hey, we got that special test. However, what the patients need to know is there are a lot of false positives. Therefore, if a woman had an MRI, and there are four or five false positives within that same MRI, that particular woman is probably going to have four or five biopsies, all of which perhaps would have been negative. Number two problem with the test is insurance companies very often refuse to mm -hmm. allow it because the test costs them a lot of money. A mammogram might cost the, cost the insurance company $60, $70, and an MRI is going to cost them a minimum of about $25,000 to $3,000. So they don't want to do it anyway. And for very small lesions that perhaps are not apparent, or what we call pre-malignant lesions, the MRI may not find it. I think we're entering a world where the MRI is going to become a very useful tool soon, and we'll have clearer indications. But it's important to ask your doctor about the MRI. Should I have it? Uh, women who are at high risk for breast cancer, who have very dense breasts, in whom you have a feeling about but are unable to make that diagnosis. The secret to breast cancer is very simple, and uh, I don't know if I'll have time later to talk about it, and I don't want to occupy too much time. But the real truth is this, that no one should die of breast cancer. Zero should be the number. Instead, still to this day, 35 to 40,000 women annually are dying of breast cancer, and that is absurd. What I want to see happen is this, that there are two or three caveats that I want to leave with people. I leave them with all my new patients and all my patients in general. And one is this. A negative mammogram means nothing. Put that in your head and don't forget it. Number two, in 100% of the time when a woman dies of breast cancer, it means one thing. It doesn't mean 12 things. It means one thing. That one thing it means is that the surgeons got there too late. In every case, regardless of the type of cancer. So let's not get there too late. Know about your mammogram report. Know about your BIRADS rating. Women's today, women today get a, a small little paper in the mail, smaller than your pad, which says your mammogram was okay or it wasn't okay. That's nonsense, too. 
-hmm. We need to know about BIRADS reading. Mammograms for the last 20 or more years have been categorized from one to five. Ask your doctor or the facility, what was my rating? What should I do? And lastly, but not leastly, I want to see in my lifetime the well care of the breast delivered back in the hands of the surgeons. There is not a gynecologist that operates on the breast. The internist doesn't have time to do the proper exam, nor are they in the operating room. Everyone can examine your breasts, but the surgeon must have the final word. And kind of that's my speech on breast cancer. Well said. Like very, very nice speech. We enjoyed that. <laughs> well, thank you. But now I've got to go into a topic I enjoy about okay. eating. Eating. <laughs> and I, I, well, I can't ask the audience members. I want to know what are the good restaurants that you guys, some tips, some things that we may not know about. I, don't, I know like the River Cafe, everyone knows, beautiful place. But what, what about a secret little hideaway somewhere? Anybody? Uh, I'm going to start Dr. Schifrin. I love Aldila right here on Fifth Avenue. Aldila. Aldila. It's a small Italian place. It's operated by a very nice couple. She's a chef and the husband is kind of helping around. And they serve beautiful food. Do you need a reservation? Um, they don't take reservations, unfortunately. And on the Friday night, it could be very crowded. So it's sometimes there's a wait for about an hour. But the food is delicious. And it's a very small kind of a communal place. There are those long communal tables mm. with chairs. And you kind of feel Did they know you there. in there? Not at all. Uh, uh, Not at all. My wanna... kids love it. They have a rabbit stew. They have all sorts of things. Rabbit stew, interesting. Mm -hmm. And beet raviolis are my favorite. Oh, so oh. I think I all right, there's a good Dr. Patton. Well, one of my colleagues, that's her favorite place to go for lunch because it's not as crowded at lunchtime. Yep. Yep. But she likes Aldi Law as well. And where, that's on Fifth Avenue? Fifth and Garfield. Very good, good recommendation out there. And Dr. Seminara? Well, I do have a little hideout too. <laughs> it's called Villa Paradiso. It's a small Italian restaurant. Oh, that's a nice one. That's you know that, nice one? know that one? I worked there actually when I was a teenager. I used to play the piano. Mm -hmm. uh, but it still has the greatest Italian food in my opinion. That is At true. least as good as Aldi La. And it's, <laughs> it's on 20th Avenue and Bath Avenue in Brooklyn. Oh, nice. And like free cocktail if you mention this show. Free cocktail. Free Villa cocktail Paradiso. for everybody who comes if you mention the show. Even a screwdriver. You can get. Even a screwdriver. <laughs> okay. You can get two <laughs> screwdrivers. This is great. So there's a good tips. I'm going to throw in Okinawas. Have you ever heard of that place? Mm -hmm. Okinawas. It's yeah. on 8th Avenue, 8th Street and 7th Avenue, a Greek mm -hmm. place. And if you do mention the show, they, right. they'll say hi. Oh. So, <laughs> so that's, a, that's, that's what you're getting out of there. So don't, don't expect anything. I like they, that place. They still have the first nickel. I've never been to that place. I have to try it out. Try it out. Okinawa. I like it. Okay. I like it. They're friendly. And they, yeah, they yeah. love this show. Ask the, if you mention, ask the doctor. They really will take care of you. So. And it's, it's a young guy whose father owns the donut store up the block and always wanted to work with the father, so they're now two stores away. It's a nice story. Very good. It is. Very good. So now this is Rhonda, who wants to know about acid reflux. She's taking medicine for it, and she finds that if she doesn't, she doesn't need to take as much, only if she really needs it. The question is, now she was told about papaya enzymes, manuka honey, and folic acid, in which she would like to take a natural alternative. What do you think of these? Also, is there any surgery that can correct this problem? That it's very annoying to her. So she doesn't like her medicine that she was given, but she wants to take Anuka. What, anuka? It's some manuka. kind of... Manuka. It's Manuka what? honey. Oh, Manuka. manuka so manuka you seem honey. to know. What's the story here with this? <laughs> uh, you know, there are a lot of herbal uh, uh, medicines and alternative medicines, and we call this whole CAM thing, right, which is a complementary alternative medicine. And there are a lot of good things on the market that you could try. The acid reflux, however, is a true disease, and that's where this, you know, the sphincter is not closed into too much, mm -hmm. and the acid goes into the esophagus, which is your food pipe, and it can introduce a lot of troubles there. So the reason for the um, medicine is to help with the symptoms, of course, but also to prevent that acid coming back and causing the burning and Barrett's esophagus and possibility of cancer. It is important. It is very important to discuss with, with your physician and have regular endoscopies done which is that test where you swallow the camera and the doctor looks inside and yeah. see whether or not you do have, God forbid, something terrible. Um, a manuka honey is not really, to my knowledge, is used for the acid reflux. Um, neither does the uh, papain, which is the papaya enzyme. Now, papaya is a wonderful fruit and has a lot of fiber and is, is good for you, but I don't think you should use that uh, for treatment of a true, true acid reflux, which is a disease that can really kill you in the end. Very good. Barbara, anything else? Yeah, and, and I don't think there's anything wrong with having papaya in addition to your medicine because it may help with the symptoms a little bit, but you shouldn't use it instead of your medicine. Interesting. 
Let's see if we can get our satellite revved up, that big giant satellite on top of the building here. Go back to 7th Avenue if we can make a connection with the team out there. And I think uh, we have Clara's waiting uh, patiently on the street there. Maybe a little rain. Is Clara out there? Hi, Dr. Gone. I want to ask, how come when my doctor sends me for mammography, he'll also recommend a sonogram? Is it because like they could really look into the breast more with the sonogram? And why isn't the mammography enough? Umbrella. I like that umbrella. Good color. <clears throat> Dr. Seminar, what's the story here? The story here is thank you for the great question. I, I think that's a wonderful question. Um, mammograms and sonograms check different things. Basically, your mammogram is going to check different types of densities in your breasts and look for things that we call calcifications or certain types of things in a dense breast. It's not going to show you perhaps what the sonogram might show you. The sonogram is a pretty reliable structure in terms of showing fluid and air and fluid and air interfaces. So things like cysts and nodules that might not be seen at all on mammogram are seen on ultrasound. However, since it's 2011, I think it's important to address the fact that a lot of radiologists and radiology centers will not do a sonogram, even if it's written that way because they feel that it might uncover things that perhaps they didn't need to know about. So be adamant about your request. I do believe everyone should have a mammogram and a sonogram. And the reason I do that is the sonogram carries no radiation to you. You can have sonograms all day long and it's not going to hurt you. And if it finds one person or saves one life, it was well worth it. We live in a world today of course containment expenditures, and sometimes it interferes with how well we take care of patients. So I agree with mammogram and sonogram, and I agree absolutely in understanding that a negative mammogram, including sonogram, means nothing. Communicate with your doctor. I don't want to see anyone get sick of breast cancer. Great. Any other comments? Dr. Gatton or um, Nina? I you? think it's very well answered. Very good. Let's go back out to the street because um, I know people are waiting out there. There's big crowds for me. It's almost like Times Square on New Year's Eve. We got <laughs> Gina, Gina, I hear you're out there. You hear a lot about digital mammographies, and I'm wondering if they would create a lot of false alarms for things that aren't really a problem. So she wants to know about digital. Sure. Um, I think that's another terrific question for everyone to hear the answer to. Um, absolutely. Digital mammogram is the current mode or methodology, if you will, of having mammograms. Digital mammograms are almost like a color photograph as compared to black and white. The reader can see things a lot clearer and a lot better uh, and actually be um, a little better with reading your report. However, a good radiologist, uh, if your center doesn't have digital mammogram, uh, it has been proven, can decipher or see it the same. But digital mammogram is the state of the art today. It's a clearer, nicer looking picture, and anytime we have anything that enhances the readability of any picture or photograph at any time, it's an absolute advantage, and frankly, all centers should be digital today. Well, we're going to get to um, Mike. I know Mike's waiting out on the street there, um, the crowd building again. Mike, is, uh, Mike, what do you have to ask us? My father is 86 years old. Do we still have to worry about his cholesterol? <laughs> 86 years old. I'd what do you think? Me. Made it to 86. What why do I why think? should you bother the guy? He wants to have ice cream. He wants whipped cream. He wants ice. Why, why can't he have it? I, it? Who could have it, of course? If he doesn't suffer from diabetes and, and, and things like that, then it's a reasonable amount. Um, healthy diet is something that we, we always recommend. But controlling cholesterol becomes paramount when you get older. Because as we know, cholesterol is part of all those plaques or buildup mm -hmm. in the arteries. And your arteries at 86 are not what they used to be at 16. And if you let your bad cholesterol, which is the LDL, build up, it can destabilize the plaque and cause heart attacks and strokes and clogged arteries in the, in the legs. And all of that is preventable and avoidable if you actually take medicines or try to control it with the lifestyle modifications, healthy diet and exercise. That's good. And what do you think? I think that's absolutely true. I think 
God bless him for making it to 86, but he absolutely should control his cholesterol. And there's no question about cholesterol buildup in the arteries and what stuff looks like. But you know what? There's something else, too, that we all have to consider, I think. And I think that answers or portends to the question a little bit, which is this. Fun. Human beings need to have some fun. So... If a little bowl of ice cream with some chocolate whipped cream or, or whatever it is you want is going to turn you on a little bit, have it at 86 or 87. And but just be a, a little jurisprudence in what you do. But you know what? I don't want to take fun away uh, and uh, to this wonderful survivor who is now 86, 87 years old too. And I absolutely agree that you should be able to have some ice cream and enjoy yourself, but you can get your cholesterol checked. Yeah, and if you, I agree with that, you know. too. Remember and take medicine that could yeah. control And then have the ice cream. Remember the joke? <laughs> Which is the life quality, very important. <laughs> if it kills her, it kills her. I won't give the whole lead up to that joke, but it's right. a good one. So um, now we're going to take a break. And this is the exciting part of the show. Not that this wasn't exciting, but we're going to come back to the rapid fire sequence. Oh boy. We've lined up 16 questions that we're going to go around and answer. Regardless of who gets it, we're going to go one, two, three, four, and so on. So. Don't go too far. Remember, our topics are emergency medicine, breast disease, and geriatrics. And we're going to be right back. I'm Dr. Steve Garner, the host of Ask the Doctor. In addition to watching Ask the Doctor every Tuesday night at 8, you can also visit www.netny.net slash askthedoctor. There you can find the topics and guests of each episode. You can read my column from the week for the tablet, and for more advice, you can watch episodes you've missed. More importantly, you can post your questions and I'll answer them on the video blog. So visit www.netny.net slash askthedoctor and get your daily dose of healthy advice. And welcome back to this very special episode of Ask the Doctor, where our topics are emergency medicine, breast disease, and geriatric medicine. And once again, we have Dr. Barbara Gatton, Dr. Robert Seminara, and Dr. Ina Schifrin. Let me just go over that quiz one more time because I want to make sure everybody has a good shot at it. Just as a lead in, the 83rd Annual Academy Awards will take place on February the 27, 2011. Who got the longest standing ovation of all time at the Academy Awards? Now email us your answer to askthedoctor at netny.net. Have you watched some of the awards shows yet? The SAG and so on? Yes. Well, I just thought of who I think the answer is, and I'm not going to say it. You can't give them any help out I there. I can't, no? and I may be wrong. You wanna, if I you just... want to just sort of say it when no one's listening. Uh, I might. <laughs> I'm, I'm very excited about it now. And um, it was quite a legend. It was a legend, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. Dr. Seminara, did you watch any of the shows? Any of these costumes, I mean, these dresses and so on? What do you think? I don't catch too much of it, but uh, I do on occasion, and uh, it's really quite, quite elaborate and extravagant, a lot of fun. I like the red carpet segment, right, where they're walking in and they're making comments on what they're wearing. I, I like to watch it, but it's one of my pet peeves are the shoes. What, yeah, what about these shoes? Oh, I'm so with you on this one. <laughs> <laughs> well, my problem has less to do with fashion. It has to do with the fact that the high heels are getting higher and higher and more people are wearing high heels, which is job security for me because it means more <laughs> broken ankles and broken feet, but it's not good for women's feet. And at some point, we need to start thinking about our health because it's not just bad for your feet and your ankles, it's bad for your knees and your back. And you know, it may look good when you're 20, but you want to still be walking when you're 70 and 80. So I uh, want lower and lower shoes. Yeah, and the price should be lower. I, I went in with my wife to the <laughs> Saks. They have a shoe department. You've been there on the top floor? Just takes up the whole thing. They get these <laughs> shoes with the red bottoms that you, you walk out That's with. That's the Christian Louboutins. I finally saved enough. I have a pair. I'm, yeah, I'm a proud order of a single <laughs> pair of Christian Louboutins. Yeah, I don't know what this. Um, you cannot walk in those. I'm a proud debtor. You cannot yeah. walk in those. Yeah. And then the other ones that are this Those and the other one. Um, from Sex in the City, what was the one they used to wear? Manola Blonics. Manola Blonics, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I cannot afford that one. That one. You know why they're red soles, though, right? But, you know, a friend why of mine buys souls? them on eBay. She gets the Manola Blonics on eBay for 70 years. You never know what you're going to find out on Ask the Doctor. Isn't that amazing? <laughs> what, what, tell me why they're red The reason bottoms. he got an idea, actually, from the uh, Parisian streets. Oh, Where, nice. you know, the women of certain behavior used oh, to return oh, home oh. after the, the yes, uh, oh, full actually, night of work. Yes. And that's where the butchers used to be done with their uh, meat for the day and oh, used to throw the out the, um, yeah, the yeah, blood the and everything else. Oh. Yeah. So they would... That is a great yes, trivia. Yes, We're yes, gonna have to, there you go. Yes, you never know what you're going to find. You don't <laughs> get this on other shows, right? <laughs> okay. 
rapid fire segment now. Let's sit down, you know, fasten your seatbelts, as they say, and here we go. Question number one is going to be from Dr. Gatton. I have atrial fibrillation and I'm on Coumadin. I have to get my blood checked frequently. I heard of something new where you don't have to. What do you think of the new medication? I think that if your Coumadin is well controlled, stay with it. It may be worth switching medicine, but you need to talk to your daughter for your doctor first because it's very, very important if you have atrial fibrillation to stay on that medicine. And it's true, it is a bit of a hassle to always go every week and get your blood checked, but it's important to do. Very good. Okay, now Dr. Uh, Seminara is getting mm -hmm. a chest pain question, okay? Even though he's right. not. Give it, and we talked about this before. Sure. I want to see, this is like a little review. How well, do you, you know when chest pain is serious? Anytime mm -hmm. you have pain that you can't understand, that you have any question about, and you're not feeling good, one of the most important things we want to know from a, a nurse who's taking care of one of our, any of our patients is, how does the patient look? And if the nurse or healthcare helper says, the patient doesn't look good, that's more material than we could want. So anytime you've got any kind of pain in the chest that you're not sure as to what it is, explore it and go to the ED. Very good. Let's go now to this good one for Dr. Schifrin. At what age should I stop getting colonoscopy? <laughs> now, this guy's 82. You don't let him have ice cream. You, now you want him to keep getting that. What, you, what is the story? <laughs> it depends. They're 82s and 82s. Geriatric patients are very different, unlike kids. Kids at six all the same. Patients at 82 are all different. It depends what your life expectancy is. It depends when was your last colonoscopy. Was it normal? Did you have any polyps? Um, are you a smoker? Do you have a family history? So that would be the question for a primary care generally. If you don't have anemia, if your screening hemocalls that we talked about today are fine, if your recent colonoscopy was done five years ago and it's normal, probably not. But again, I would address that question with the primary so care. So no one size fits all? Absolutely Even with not. the colonoscopy too? With geriatric okay. patients, right. never. Never. Very good. Okay, we're going back to Dr. Gatton now for her question. I take antacids for heartburn. My husband heard about brittle bones and the medication for heartburn? What's the story? A lot of drugs have interactions and it's true you want to you want to check your bone density as you're getting older but as Dr. Schifrin had said earlier heartburn is can be a protect, potentially serious problem. It's not just that it's annoying and it's a little uncomfortable it can lead to serious consequences and in worst case scenario even cancer so it's important to control it so it's true that there may be side effects of medicines but that's something else to talk to your doctor about on what are the interactions between the different medicines and is this the right medicine for you very good now you watch the cash cab anybody mm -hmm. watch that show it's a great show right they line in the back and you can call a mobile street shout out right. or you can call someone now this is not a surgeon's question, but right. you're going to get it because you're, you're in line. I'm ready. What is the okay? I got a little high blood pressure. Maybe I'm 140 over 90. What's the best blood pressure medication to start taking for this mild high blood pressure? Usually, and again, I'm not the internist, but usually it's a diuretic that is the first line of medication to take for hypertension. But again, it's not one size fits all. That might not be good for you. Uh, it might affect your electrolytes. Talk to your doctor about it and get it done. Good question for a surgeon. Good answer mm -hmm. for a surgeon. I mean, right? Very Correct good. Correct one, too. It was right. Oh, yeah. it was right. Excellent. Wow, good luck. Excellent. We love that. Okay. What Dr. about Schifrin. the ice cream? You can have your ice cream. <laughs> <laughs> Dr. Schifrin, I'm taking, a, let's say, an indoral type drug, a beta blocker for atrial fibrillation. I'm so tired all the time. Any tricks to lessen the symptoms? I assume the question is about the symptoms of a beta blocker, which mm -hmm. is a side effect. Yes. Because atrial fibrillation, if it's not controlled, if your heart is fluttering, that can also lead to fatigue and tiredness. Oh. So the question, the true question would be, is the fatigue because of the atrial fibrillation and the consequences of that disease, or is it truly a beta blocker metoprolol side effect? Because beta blockers could sometimes cause fatigue. Sometimes changing a time of your beta blocker could help. Oh. If you take it after dinner, then you don't have as much side effects. Also, it's absorbed better with food, so then maybe you could take a lower dose. Again, atrial fibrillation could be controlled with other medicines or with a different beta blocker um, that could be addressed. So there's, there's more than one way to skin a cat. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Very good. Okay, Dr. Gatton, here we go. I get panic attacks a few times a week. What are they and what can I do about it? That's not an easy question. That's a tough question yeah. because panic attacks are common and it's good that you recognize that that's what it is because sometimes it's as simple as saying, okay, I'm having a panic attack. What is it that's triggering it? Stop, take deep breaths. Some simple things that have been shown to help panic attacks 
proper sleep hygiene, um, avoiding the stressful situations, meditation has been known to help. But at the moment of the panic attack, stop, take a deep breath, say, I know what this is, relax, slow down, try and step out of a situation if it's an upsetting situation to you, and back to the same thing you're hearing all night, talk to your doctor about it. Good answer, I like that answer. Do you get a panic attack when you come on the show? Or no? No. Never. Never, I'm always happy to see you. Thank you, thank you. Okay, <laughs> Dr. Simon, a tough one again. Okay. I wake up from sleep, no. short of breath, and I think I'm gonna die. Yep. What's going on? Well, what's going on is this. I think uh, question number seven and question number eight have a lot to do with each other. Very often when uh, we go to bed at night, we start to review everything that happened during the day and we start to get a little bit philosophical before it's time to go to sleep instead of letting us unwind properly. So, if that's happening, okay, that uh, you're dealing with some anxiety. Number one, try not to have too much caffeine, especially before mm -hmm. going to bed. In the afternoon, after two, three o'clock, we all have such busy lives and everyone's getting up early. Probably none of us are getting enough sleep or certainly the kind of sleep we really need. Uh, we all work too hard here uh, in America. So try to do that. And if it continues, you're still having anxiety, that's not healthy. And that's not the way to live your life and be happy. And part of the ice cream answer was being happy. So <laughs> talk to your doctor. Maybe you want to speak to a psychologist. But you know what? Get a good night's sleep and have some fun. Now, Dr. Schifrin, this guy's concerned. He's got to wear a mask when he goes to sleep for sleep apnea. He's taking beta blockers, which is not helping his romantic life either. What is he supposed to do now? Is there any alternative to wearing that mask? I assume the doctor gave him a mask because he was diagnosed with a sleep apnea, which is a very serious disease with a lot of potential complications. So the last thing I would advise to a patient like that is to stop wearing the mask because there is no alternative. There are some surgical options for people with a particular type of sleep apnea, but again, if the pulmonologist, which is the lung doctor most often than not, recommended the mask, the mask is important. What the patient could do is to lose the weight because more often than not, people with sleep apnea are, are extremely obese and overweight. And there are some surgical and non-surgical options to help with the obesity. That's where I would go to Very good. So nobody, nobody's gotten stumped on here. And I can't, now I have to turn all the cards over. The show time is up. <laughs> show is over. It's over. But uh, uh, it was a quick show, and I, I hope you enjoyed it at home. And, uh, um, I want to thank our, our doctors, Dr. Barbara Gatton, Dr. Robert Seminara, and Dr. Ina Schifrin for coming in. And we hope we're able to help you. Now remember, it's good to be proactive about your health. You have to speak to your doctors about your concerns. Go for second or third opinions. I can't tell you how many times we get calls here where they're afraid to talk to the doctor or they didn't have the time to talk. But you can visit our website now at netny.net slash doctor. Here you can see video blogs, the tablet column, podcasts, our forum, you can send in quiz questions that we can ask others, and many more. Now, you can also watch last night's episode at 10 p.m., so if, at last week's episode. So if you, if for some reason you didn't have enough of us here, turn on to channel uh, 30 or 97 at 10 o'clock, and you're going to be happy. I want to thank to Dr. Linda Lapitosa, our quiz master, and I want to thank you for all your questions. So until next time, goodbye, stay well, and I'll see you in the tablet. Mm -hmm.